Five, four, three, two, one. Puck Short. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the One Puck Short podcast, episode 89. And I'm delighted to be joined by a writer from the Hockey News, a return guest on the show. Please welcome Matt Larkin. Matt, hi, how are you? Rob, long time no talk. Very nice to be back talking with you now. Yeah, it has been a long time. Absolutely, I'll be talking off air just before we started about the the elite league work I've been doing and uh, how that kind of derailed things for one poke short for a while. But back on it now, and so far so good. Things have gone without a hitch, which I'm going to use as a beautiful segue into Edmonton's coaching chain. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Hitchcock in, Todd McClellan out. Uh, the Oilers won four three in San Jose last night in overtime. I should add. There were 3-7-0 and oh in the 10 games leading up to Todd McClellan's departure. I mean, was that a change you felt that the Oilers needed to make to salvage their season, maybe? I do think it was the right change. I don't know if it will prove being the ultimate necessary change, but it's a step. I think we may be looking at management, some deeper changes later in the year, or in the summer at least. But in the short term... I do think Ken Hitchcock is a good choice. I actually was was preaching for the Oilers to hire Ken Hitchcock three years ago. Someone dug up an old blog of mine and sent me the link. I'd forgotten I'd written that, but <laughs> I think the, the logic, that's funny, but the logic uh, behind my suggestion a few years ago has not changed. And two things that are interesting about Ken Hitchcock as a coach. One, even though I believe he'll be the oldest coach in the NHL now, um, he is a specialist when it comes to working with young players. And I remember him saying this before when I, I was seeing him speak the day he won the Jack Adams Award as Coach of the Year for the St. Louis Blues in 2011-12. And he was explaining he goes to seminars and he learns all this different philosophy about how to connect with young people, how to learn what music they like, all these different tricks. And he's, a, he's sort of a student when it comes to learning how to connect with young players. So he does have a knack for doing that. And the second thing about Hitchcock that's very characteristic of his coaching style is he always coaches defensively airtight teams. If you look at every single team he's taken over, whether it was the Philadelphia Flyers in the early 2000s, uh, when he first became coach of the Dallas Stars in the late 90s, especially when he took over the St. Louis Blues and even the Columbus Blue Jackets, but I think the Blues are the best example. He turns that team into a lockdown defensive unit. The quality of chances goes way down for the other team. So I think the Oilers, a big problem has been that they've been very defensively leaky. They've gotten bad goaltending, but to me, it's always fascinating that whoever is the goalie on a Ken Hitchcock team almost always ends up with good numbers. And I think part of it is that his defense groups manage to limit the quality of chances. So what I'm expecting to see is easier work for Kim Talbot and Miko Koskinen in the weeks and months to come. Yeah, you mentioned the defensive aspect there. I think particularly the penalty kill hasn't been great for Edmonton this year. I had a little look at Cam Talbot's numbers yesterday after the news broke, and that's kind of where he suffered as well, I think, this year on the penalty kill. Maybe not had the help you would like from the Oilers' defense. And, and that's certainly an area I think a lot of people, as you say, would expect Hitchcock to improve the Oilers on because it's you know almost his calling card in a way. But one of the things that really struck me about Edmonton this year is the way scoring drops off after their big three. And Connor McDavid, 31 points. Leon Dreisaitl, 26. Ryan Nugent Hopkins has 20 points. After that, nobody else has even reached double figures. <laughs> Alex Chayerson has nine points, eight of which are goals because of his crazy shooting percentage. He's over 42%. But yeah, they're really struggling to get good secondary scoring. Uh, do you think Hitchcock maybe helps there, or does this again come back to what you maybe hinted at with whether management carry the can later in the year or at the end of the season for the way this roster has been constructed? Yeah, I, I'm not overly optimistic that if the Oilers get back to being relevant this year that it's going to be because they, they gain the ability to have scoring depth. I think <laughs> the way they're going to do it will be by allowing fewer goals, which means that all the all the effort you get from Connor McDavid, the top-heavy team, might be enough to win games 3-2, things like that, uh, uh, most nights. And if anything... I wouldn't be surprised to see Hitchcock double down and give Connor McDavid even more ice time. And the example I think of is Tyler Sagan uh, in Hitchcock's uh, one year he came back with the Dallas Stars. And Sagan was telling me this actually a few weeks ago, that Hitchcock gave him the opportunity and wasn't afraid to tell him if he was doing anything wrong, but just kept throwing him out there, uh, not just in the prominent number one center role, but also on the penalty kill. And Sagan had never been a penalty killer before. So I wouldn't be surprised to see 
Hitchcock deploying Connor McDavid in a bunch of different situations, more penalty kill time, maybe double shifting, that kind of thing. So we might end up seeing an even more skewed scoring balance on the Oilers. Do you think the kind of weird, almost tire fire the Pacific Division has been so far, is that going to help Edmonton? Because, I mean, they're only a point back of Vancouver. They have two games in hand on the Canucks as well. So they kind of made the change at maybe the right time to, to salvage that that season to end that bad run hopefully they'll after the win in, in san jose and they play anaheim and uh, los angeles two other teams struggling in their division and as i said it's so topsy-turvy right now they could very quickly find themselves even catching the flames in second in the division and maybe the sharks at the top yes i do think if there's any division <laughs> the oilers could be in right now pacific is the one and case in point I, I believe the vancouver canucks have lost what five straight games six straight games and they're still yeah. in a playoff spot what does that tell you, right? And <laughs> you do have a couple teams that are still sort of finding out their identity in rebuild mode in Arizona and Vancouver. Uh, and you have the Kings that have sort of bottomed out with that slow, sort of archaic roster structure. I don't think the Kings are going to be a threat. The Ducks have been absolutely ravaged by injuries this season, so that's been a big problem for them. And their core forwards is also aging out. So there is room. I agree. The Oilers could squeak into a playoff spot, and they might not even have to have a particularly strong record. So there is something to play for, which I think is why it was prudent to make this coaching change now while there is still time. The other team who've uh, made a coaching change this week, St. Louis Blues, Mike Yo dismissed. Kind of similar to the Oilers in a way. They had a bad run. They're 7-9-3 to start the season. They're 30th overall, incredibly, considering the roster they have. Seven points outside the playoffs and in a much tougher division, I think, in the Central, even with the Blackhawks struggling and in decline. You know, they've got the Predators, the Avs are on the up, the Wild. I mean, do you think this change is enough for the Blues as well? They've got Barubian as the interim head coach. He did okay with the Flyers before for a time, but... I mean, is there a way back for St. Louis? Can they make up that ground? I think there's a way back uh, just because the Blues, their roster on paper, they do have a lot of talent. They do have a lot of depth. And they are predicted to be one of the most improved teams in the league by many people, including myself and, and the hockey news in general. We thought they would be a playoff team this year because they added a lot. And they were almost a playoff team last year. They were so close. So I do think that they have the depth to make something happen. Um, it's just a matter of, is Craig Brube the man to get that out of them? I'm not sure. Um, it's different when it's an interim hire as opposed to someone being plucked and sought out, right? Uh, but we do see historically, and I, I remember a colleague of mine researched this, cr crunched the numbers a couple of years ago, um, that new coaches do tend to create an emotional spike in their team. And it's almost uh, almost 100% consistent that a team that has a coaching change goes on a run when a new coach comes in, at least for a little while. So I would not be surprised to see the Blues have a bit of a surge, just like they did when Hitchcock left uh, and, and Mike Yo came and took over the bench permanently uh, as the exclusive coach. The Blues had a nice surge as well. So I do think we're going to see some kind of pushback from them. Uh, at the same time... I, I, I still wonder if GM Doug Armstrong eventually will find the crosshairs on him um, because there are certain elements of this team that just don't seem to be repaired and as much as they're trying to find scoring and hasn't broken through yet. And to me, the, the main problem is goaltending. And every year, it just seems like Jake Allen, he was a, a much ballyhooed prospect. He was supposed to be great. Now he's 28 years old. He's not a prospect anymore. He's arguably the, the least consistent goaltender in the NHL. And every season, it seems like whoever the backup is, creates this goalie controversy, and he's pushing him for starts. It was Carter Hutton last year. It was Brian Elliott for many years in the past. It's Chad Johnson now. And I do wonder if eventually if the Blues don't improve, uh, if ownership has to start looking at the overall roster architecture and the person making those decisions, which would be Doug Armstrong. Yeah, of course. I mean, one thing that, that struck me, and it's interesting you, you touched on Jake Allen, because that was one of the points that Cat Silverman and I discussed on the last episode of the podcast, because again, it wasn't working for the Blues in net. Their goals against per game right now is 3.11. That's the 19th in the NHL, so below halfway. And their offense is, is in a similar position, ranked 19th in the NHL, 2.95 goals for per game. So they're obviously in the negative their power play has cooled off. They've been shut out in three of the last four. It's just a real cold snap built on top of a team already in a difficult situation, I think. It's true. And 
The only thing I can say for the Blues is if it doesn't work out this year, um, I, I still see reason for hope because they have some very promising prospects. Even though they sent Tage Thompson away to get Ryan O'Reilly, eventually, I mean, Robert Thomas, he's gotten a bit of an opportunity, but he has a very bright future as a two-way player. Jordan Kiru has very exciting offensive capability, very dynamic player, and Clint Costin as well, big, big, powerful forward. So uh, I, I believe that there's hope. It's just a matter of can the young guys, can they find their game and become relevant NHLers before you see guys like Vladimir Tarasenko and Ryan O'Reilly head toward the end of their primes. You want it all to happen at the same time, and it's tough to say whether that will happen with the Blues. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned some key names there. Tarasenko, he's 26. O'Reilly, 27. Jaden Schwartz is 26. Pietrangelo, 28. Perico, 25. So they've got this call all around the same sort of age. And, and you can include Jake Allen there as well at 28. But whether, you know, these younger guys you mentioned there, and Vili Husso, the goaltender as well, whether they try and maybe reach some sort of transition phase where they move out the Jay Boomisters who, who were scratched earlier in the season and look to bring in some other young guys, maybe some picks if they get towards the deadline and, and they're still in a bit of a hole. But they're a, a really interesting team in the sense that a lot of people expected quite a lot from the Blues, as they have for many years now, even dating back to sort of the Chris Pronger era. But they've never quite taken that step. And, and this is almost a step back, which is, is a really surprising, I think. I agree. I guess we can take solace from the fact that I believe, my memory serves me right, at around this time last year, the Blues were at the bottom of the league. And they fought all the way back with a lot of the same roster composition. And they, I think they missed the playoffs by, by one point, if I'm not mistaken. So we've seen this group show the ability to fight back. It's just a matter of, will they do it this time? And also, will they be healthy enough? Jaden Schwartz is a guy that he's a little bulldog of a player, and he's a great player when he's on the ice, but he gets hurt so frequently, and it's happened again. It seems like it's always just a matter of time before the next injury. So it's also difficult for the Blues when, whenever it seems like they're trying to get some momentum, one of their most important players in Schwartz seems to get hurt. You mentioned that the Blues went on a bit of a tear through the sort of second half of last season, just fell short. Another team hoping to avoid the American Thanksgiving curse, shall we call it. The teams who are six points or more outside of the playoffs at American Thanksgiving, 80% of them fail to cover the, the ground and make the playoffs. The Pittsburgh Penguins find themselves in that situation right now, though, incredibly, considering the team they have suffered their fourth straight loss to the Buffalo Sabres on Monday night. They lost it overtime, having been 4-1 up as well. Uh, they're 1-7-2 and two in their last 10. They do get Sidney Crosby back against Dallas tonight on Wednesday, as when we're talking. He missed three games and up a body injury, but 29th overall, five points outside of the playoffs. And in a Metro division, which is a little funky again, but with some decent teams in the mix, that's a, a tough sell for the Penguins. Uh, maybe Mike Sullivan's the next one. We're talking about losing his job. I think it's fair to at least ask the question. And when it comes to the Penguins, there's always been this air of invincibility. I mean, hey, they're the team that has future Hall of Fame with Sidney Crosby and Jenny Malkin. It seems like those guys are never going to exit their primes, and the Penguins will always be competitive. But if we just blindly believe that, it means we've learned nothing from the Chicago Blackhawks and L.A. Kings. And those are two teams that were also seemingly invincible. And those three teams together, Chicago, L.A., Pittsburgh, they accounted for nine Stanley Cups in a span of, I think, nine years or ten years, right, in a decade. Uh, but what happened with L.A. and Chicago was you win the championships, you award your star players with big money, your roster becomes extremely top-heavy, you have to keep replacing the depth with cheaper players, which works until the top players start to age out of their primes, and then the entire system collapses because there's not enough support once the top players are out of, out of their primes. So with Pittsburgh, you're starting to see signs of the same decay. I don't think we're seeing Crosby and Malkin regress, but other pieces on the Penguins maybe a little bit, and their depth, it's, it's just not what it was. And the problem with paying your top stars so much money is you can't really do much in the offseason to improve the team. And the Penguins, I, I believe Jack Johnson was considered their biggest offseason upgrade, which obviously is not enough for a team that got knocked out in the second round of the playoffs. So it, it's a tough pill to swallow, but it's sort of the reality. And I always say this to fans of the Penguins, Blackhawks, and Kings. It's also, it's okay. 
So in each of these cases, these teams, they traded away their first-round picks. Penguins have had one first-round pick in the past five years, and they traded him away. It was Kasperi Kapanen. So when you keep trading your futures, eventually it'll reach a point where you don't have any exciting, good young players. And people keep trying to shoehorn Daniel Sprong into that title, but he wasn't a first-round pick for a reason, and, and it hasn't panned out with him. And again, that's okay. The Penguins mortgage their future. They won a couple more Stanley Cups, and eventually they're going to have to pay the piper, just as L.A. and Chicago are doing. That's fine. You got your championships. It's always worth it to do so. But we knew this was coming. So is it finally the collapse we've been expecting from Pittsburgh? Maybe at the same time, this this losing streak has coincided with Sidney Crosby missing a week. So maybe when he's back in the lineup, we'll see this team surge again. And he is slated to rejoin them now. So I wouldn't give up on the Penguins just yet. Um, but at the same time, Jim Rutherford, one of the more aggressive GMs in the league, he's not afraid to make big-time trades, or change coaches mid-season. So uh, I don't expect this team to rest on its laurels if, you, if it heads into December and it's still in this slump. Mm. I, I mean, one thing that maybe ties in with what we were talking about with the Oilers earlier is the secondary scoring hasn't quite been there, and, and you mentioned that. But also the defensive game hasn't been great from the Penguins this year. They don't seem quite as solid in their own end. Obviously, Justin Schultz has been sidelined for, well, he's still on the injured reserve, so he's missed you know most of the season. And... They just don't seem to be the same team in their own end, I guess, is, is the point I've made probably three times now. Yeah. <laughs> but but something just isn't working there. Matt Murray's struggling a little, whether that's a... I don't use the word hangover in relation to a guy who's had a concussion, but whether that injury has had other effects on him. He's been a little slow maybe finding his game, but equally he's not had a whole lot of help from the Penguins' defence. Right, and here's a theory I'm going to float out there, okay? The theory is the Penguins' defense is what it always was. The difference is the rest of the league is catching up. And what I mean is the Penguins famously won those two Stanley Cups, especially the second one with no Chris Letang. They won with a ragtag defense core, and their specialty was playing things very simply, getting the puck up the ice very fast because they had so much speed as a team. So guys like Brian Dumlin play a very simple game, just fire that puck away. Ian Cole, who was there at the time, same kind of thing. And the Penguins are beating teams with stretch passes, beating teams with speed. But the problem is, and, and Mike Sullivan even admitted this to me a couple of years ago, it is a copycat league. So every team is studying Pittsburgh's template, and you have other teams now becoming faster. And all of a sudden, the whole league almost, other than maybe the Kings, almost the entire NHL is fast. So the Penguins don't have the same advantages that they used to. You have other teams attacking with speed on the forecheck, which gives this group of sort of underskilled defensemen a lot less time to think. So I almost wonder if the Penguins are getting beaten by their own system now. Yeah, that's a great point. As you said, it's they set a template and others have copied that and maybe improved on it. And I know you guys touched on this on the, the most recent Hockey News podcast with, with Ryan and uh, Ken Campbell. The, the start of the season, the idea that the Penguins would be in the mix for uh, Jack Hughes would be mind-boggling. People would laugh at you, <laughs> but here we are. And, <laughs> uh, can you imagine if that is how it panned out right now? Well, hey, the Penguins, as we said, I believe in the podcast too, they're, they're, it's an unwritten rule. The Penguins get a generational talent uh, <laughs> every decade or so, so it would follow the pattern. And Mario Lemieux was around for the same rookie season. So uh, I'm just joking. My conspiracy theory, of course, was, hey, what if the Penguins are, are tanking because they know if they can get Jack Hughes, it's a young man's league. He can make an impact right away. And Crosby and Malkin will still have good years left, and the Penguins will suddenly be unstoppable. So it actually would be a boon to the franchise if that were to happen. But the problem is you can't teach. You can't. And I, I've had so many players use this exact sentence to me over the years, and it's it's uh, tanking is not in my DNA, which is true. The only way you can properly tank is the general manager's got to do it because the coach will will not be able to not try. The players will have to try. But if the GM gives the coach nothing but not good players, then it doesn't matter if you're trying, right? So, And I don't think Rutherford will do the same. The Penguins, they sort of operated in a go-for-broke type of mode the last few years as they realize they're in their championship window. So, uh, But at the same time, it might they might just be out of rope anyways, and maybe they end up in that draft lottery. It's very tough to say. Uh, I do think... Theoretically, we should see the Penguins try to acquire some help on defense. Mm -hmm. uh, Carolina, Jim Rutherford's old team, would make a lot of sense as a place to look. But the problem is the Penguins, they don't have assets right now anymore. No. Because they traded away all those picks and prospects, they don't really have much to give away. And even if you look at their existing roster, it's you know, can you, can you sacrifice a Jake Gensel to get a Justin Falk? 
for example, I don't think you can because you need Jake Gensel too because this team doesn't have much depth. So I feel like the Penguins are – they've sort of dug themselves a hole and, and I think they're going to have to find their way out of it with what they have on the existing roster. So here's a comment made slightly in jest by Sean McKendo, down goes Brown. But the more you look at it right now, the more you wonder how much of a joke it is. You've mentioned the Blackhawks, you mentioned the Kings, we've just talked about the Penguins, you mentioned the Hurricanes. All Stanley Cup winners in the cap era. Right now, what are the odds that no cap era cup winner make the playoffs this year? I think Washington and Boston probably go good. But right now, I mean, Detroit are obviously in a rebuild. And so we mentioned the Kings, mentioned the Blackhawks. Hurricanes, uh, nobody really knows whether they can make it or not. The Ducks are in a hole. I mean, that's, that's a, as I said, said in jest. But you look at the standings, you're kind of like, actually? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I think what's become the norm now is we're seeing, on average, you know, seven, I think last year was seven teams of turnover in the playoffs out of a 16-team field. So I think at this point, the unexpected is the expected. That's the irony. It's the new normal. So whatever happens by this American Thanksgiving juncture, I think we have to believe and understand that it's, it's the new reality, especially when you look at a team like Buffalo that's the hottest team in the league right now. And I think we should learn from what we saw last year from New Jersey and Colorado, two teams that were expected to be laughing stocks. And don't get me started on Vegas. Uh, <laughs> and, but every year there's at least one of those teams that's ahead of schedule in, in its rebuild. So, and when one of those teams vaults into the playoffs, it has to knock another team out. So the NHL is the league of crazy turnover. And, and just because you vault yourself in one year doesn't mean you're going to stay in. And again, we'll go back to Vegas as, the, as Exhibit A there. You have to, you have to stay <laughs> sharp in terms of what your expectations are, because I think the NHL, more than any other sport, is totally fluid that way. Yeah, and as you say, the the way it can flip so quickly, I mean, New Jersey, look at where New Jersey are right now. They're only ahead of the Penguins by virtue of the tiebreak. So they're maybe in not in much better position. I know Ray Ferraro was questioning their, their defense's ability to move the puck on the, the Pulp Hockey podcasts. Corey uh, Schneider's not quite what he was since injury, and, and Keith Kincaid's done great but he's not Corey Schneider sometimes when you need uh, you need that big guy in net to, to steal a game here and there and Schneider has sort of excelled at doing that really uh, but it's it's hard to know what to make of the Devils considering what they did last year but one thing that sticks out for me is that lack of probably a good second line center to create that one-two punch I don't think that's Travis Ajak anymore Yes, I agree with you absolutely, Rob. And and to me, the Devils, uh, speaking personally, they they are what I thought they were, and I, I wrote about it in the summer <laughs> that uh, I thought Ray Shiro was very mature with how he approached his team in the summer. Uh, he actually told me during the playoffs, we were on the phone, and he said uh, that he doesn't like building a team through free agency. And he said to me, "Okay, name one one impactful free agent in the cap era other than." Uh, Zidane Ochoa and Marion Hossa, and I, I, I was thinking, you know, okay, you know what, you're right, in, in terms of a, a UFA that really vaults, uh, changes a franchise's fate, so he doesn't believe in going that route, and I think when you see how conservative he was, to me the message was that he understands that this is a long-term rebuild, his team was ahead of schedule, it was house money, and he did not have inflated expectations going forward, I think he understands that this team needs more pieces, and uh, to me, reading between the lines, I, I felt that meant that he was willing to see his team take a step back if necessary in the name of building for the future. So they didn't make any foolish signings. They let a few important free agents go, um, expiring contracts who they acquired at the deadline, and they sort of went into the season with status quo. So I, I, I think I projected them to finish just outside the playoff picture, and I still think that's what's going to happen. And I, I also believe that's going to be good for the Devils because, like you said, they don't have that depth up the middle. Pavel Zaka has not become what he was supposed to be as a first round pick it looks like his ceiling is going to top out at maybe third liner so if the devils miss the playoffs and they get a top 10 pick i think that's a good thing um the top of this draft class looks pretty strong from what i've been told so far and i think another piece it's worth the devils missing the playoffs in the name of being better team a better team in five years yeah yeah i think that that makes perfect sense and and kind of to to paraphrase sure there not many teams have really built via free agency. I, I guess maybe to a point you could throw Tavares in there from this past summer, but the Leafs already had Austin Matthews. Uh, we'll touch on William Hunter in a minute, but Freddie Anderson that they, well, Freddie Anderson with free agency that's probably a bad example, but, but Matthews being the key point, Morgan Riley, um, 
you know, and others via trade. It wasn't a big free agency swell, which has underpinned the Maple Leafs' improvement over the last couple of years. And they've just managed to add key guys via free agency rather than revolutionize via free agency is, is the point I'm trying to make. Right. And, and Tavares uh, was sort of unprecedented yeah. as well. We, we don't know what the ripple effect is going to be because we've never seen an, an elite player uh, at that young um, hit the open market. And we almost we thought Steven Sampos was going to be the first one, but he wasn't. So Tavares, is, I guess we'll see what happens, but we can't really uh, judge the effect yet because he's the first of his kind. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Buffalo Sabres uh, a short time ago. We got kind of sidetracked with the, the Devils and a little bit of Leafs talk there. But the, the Sabres, you said, arguably the hottest team in the NHL right now. They've won six straight. They're third in the Atlantic. I know you wrote a piece for the Hockey News about why the Sabres are for real. And it's hard to argue right now the way they're playing. It's true. And, and I was sort of trying to temper Sabres fans' expectations by saying, hey, <laughs> I'm not saying they're cup contenders, but I'm saying they're in the mix now. And mm. the, uh, one example I use was if you look at their possession numbers, they're not elite now, but they, they're they not awful anymore. They, they, they've they improved from awful to mediocre. And to me, that shows a significant change in the way they play, especially on the defensive side of the puck. Uh, and I, I do think they've gotten better goaltending um it hasn't been illegal thing but again when you're upgrading over terrible it's still no <laughs> it's very easy to see why they're climbing the standings and uh, overall i was a believer in robin laner but I, if we're just comparing to him last year mm. uh, what carter hutton and linus allmark have done has been much better than what laner gave them last year yeah. um and when you have a healthy jack eichel i think people don't yet fully understand how good he is he's going to be an elite player he's very close to being an elite player already he's only 22 years old he was always projected to be a superstar and i yes. still think he has that kind of ceiling um and rasmus Dahlin, and you know he was projected as a generational talent on defense arguably the most hyped defense prospect going into the draft since denny poffin and I, I did a story on Rasmus leading up to the draft. I spoke to his old coaches, his club team and national coaches, and they all forecast to me that, you know, offense takes a while to come in a teenage defenseman typically, but they believe that his defensive game was already super mature and ready to help the Sabres, and that has been the case. He's making an impact there. They're less defensively leaky as a team. And, and while not every offseason move has paid off so far, um, I don't think anyone can deny the impact of Jeff Skinner. He's a very fast player. His skills, I think, translate better now than they did several years back. And as I wrote in the piece, he never really had a, a bona fide powerhouse number one center feeding him the puck. He was still finding ways to score 30 goals. Mm. But even when he played with Eric Stahl sometimes, he wasn't getting peak here, Eric Stahl. He had sort of late prime Eric Stahl, who wasn't nearly as effective as a player as when Stahl won right. the Stanley Cup and had 100 points. But now he's getting dynamic, elite young player Jack Eichel as his center. And I don't think it's any coincidence that you're seeing Skinner on pace to have his best season ever. Uh, especially because a lot of people forget Skinner was a bit of a phenom. He broke in the NHL. He was a child. I don't think he could even shave before he was scoring 31 <laughs> goals, winning rookie of the year. So he's not nearly as old as some people might think. He's been in the league. I think this is his ninth ninth season, but he's only 26 years old. Right. And you, and you mentioned those off-season acquisitions, you look at Conor Sheary coming in as well, and you know what couldn't the Sabres do, say, last season? Well, they couldn't really score goals, not in enough quantities, and, and you know, if you scored two or three goals on Buffalo, you were almost guaranteed the win for a little while there. And, you know, those guys coming in, Skinner, uh, Sheary, Darling will, I think over time, probably have more of an impact on the offensive game as he, as he get used to the NHL level. You know, he's had a strong start, but you know what I mean. So, I mean, what's the next step here? I mean, they look good for a, a playoff spot this year, or at least right now. I mean, what sort of timeline would you put on them really being a contender, do you think? Because, you know, right now, if they make the playoffs, that's a good season for the Sabres. But at some point, that next step has to come, doesn't it? Yes, I agree. Uh, before the season started, I said 85 points should be a goal because – they had regressed in multiple seasons in a row. So I was saying to, to Sabres and their fans, you don't even have to bet on playoffs yet, just bet on relevancy. And that's a start mm. because they haven't been even that for a long time. So I do think they've already accomplished that. I think it's pretty clear that they're going to be at least an 80-point team, even if they end up regressing for the rest of the season. Um, but I agree that the playoffs are looking more and more likely, uh, and that makes this season unqual an unqualified success for sure. 
uh, in this day and age when you have exciting young talent, I think it's more important than it used to be to become a very strong team in a short amount of time uh, and, and get some possible championships when your core is still very young, like the 2009 Pittsburgh Penguins did so, the 2010 Chicago Blackhawks. I think there's pressure on the Jets and Leafs this year and next to win the Stanley Cup because of that. They have their best players in those early prime windows. That seems to be when teams get their best shot because their star players aren't all on their second contracts yet. So uh, I I do think the Sabres are going to want to, for example, find a way to contend before Rasmus Dahlin finishes his entry-level deal. So that gives them three seasons total, right? So Mm -hmm. I do think by next season at the latest, you're going to want to see them uh, be a legitimate playoff contender. And maybe by 2020-21, you're hoping that they're a true Stanley Cup threat, but it's still early, right? It's yeah. It's been, what, 21 games. So the <laughs> yeah. sample is small, um, but I still like where the team's headed. I think they're going to need another 10-bell defense prospect. Um, but their ceiling as an offensive team, I don't think they've hit it yet because they have another guy who, as of a year ago, we rated our, our scouting panel, NHL executives and scouts, rated Casey Middlestadt, the number one prospect in hockey. This is not including Dolan. He wasn't drafted yet. So I'm yeah. talking about guys who are already drafted. Middlestadt has been the disappointment so far this season, but he's still very young. He was MVP of the World Juniors last year, and he has a very high ceiling. So when he gets going, when he starts producing like he's expected to, the Sabres are going to be much more dangerous. You mentioned Carl Hutton. He sort of parlayed a pretty good effort with the Blues last year into a three-year contract with the Sabres this year. I mean, he's a good example of this. I think Devin Dubnik as well and a few others. There really is a place in my mind for just a guy who is a steady goaltender. You know what you're going to get most nights from him. You talk about guys who have, you know, he's very high, high highs and low lows, maybe a Mike Smith type example. But there really is something to be said for a guy who will give you a consistent effort night in, night out. Because I think if you're a coach, you can build around that. You can go, right, well, look, this is his ceiling, but we know it's his ceiling. We know he'll hit it most nights. We build our defensive game around that, and we've got a good chance to win then, right? Yeah, I agree. Especially when a team is just trying to become relevant again. You don't necessarily need a goalie stealing you games yet. You just need a goalie who won't lose you games. I think you start asking the tougher questions about your goalie when you're on the cusp of Stanley Cup contention, and that's when you're looking for the guy who makes the big saves, and that sort of can separate the contenders from the championship teams. But in this phase, I I agree. If you just get a guy who's going to make the saves that he's supposed to make, (laughs) <laughs> that can really help a team, and it can it can avoid those sort of backbreaking shifts in confidence that that deflate a team when a guy lets in a soft goal. So we mentioned the name earlier. It's the story that never seems to end in hockey right now. William Nylander, D Day, as it were, is approaching December first. If we reach that date, and he hasn't got a contract signed, he has to sit out the season, or the NHL season at least. That's per the CBA. I mean, he could go and play in Europe, but. The NHL D-Day is there. Pierre Lebrun suggested that Toronto could maybe hold on until near the trade deadline and look to make a deal with a non-playoff team because if they're going to miss the playoffs anyway, they don't really care that the Island is going to miss the season. They can then worry about a, a contract extension over time. But, I mean, this one just... that No movement seems to be happening. Well, as long as the Leafs keep winning, the, you know they have all the ammunition they need to... to hold their ground to mix my metaphor slightly there but it seems inconceivable to me that that William Nyland would want to miss a whole season I agree and I've been saying all along that if we hit December 1st and Nylander isn't traded or signed if he's ruled out for the season I think it's a massive failure for everyone involved and it goes back to the point I said a few minutes ago that these young teams now, they have to take their shot when they have the right window to do it. And to me, that means the Leafs, yes, they're 15 and 6, first over, or second overall in the NHL. Um, but to me, that's all the reason why you should fight to have Nealander or a piece you can get for Nealander in your lineup because you understand you are in a Stanley Cup window. You want to put the best possible team on the ice because you have no idea if you're going to be that good again. It's never a guarantee. Uh, so that's why I believe would be a failure if he's not in the lineup question is will he be <laughs> will he be signed in the next week i don't know because i agree uh his leverage with 
the Leafs has gone down as they keep winning. And on the flip side, because the deadline is so close, I, I think the Leafs have lost a lot of leverage with trading partners. I think they're going to get more lowball offers the closer they are to the deadline. So I don't know for sure that they're going to get the offer they want for Nylander. So I don't know if trading him right now is the right solution either, uh, which is why I've sort of been a champion for the bridge contract. Even the one-year rest-of-season bridge contract, that means the cap pit won't have any effect on what Matthews and Mitch Marner get. And you get Nylander in the lineup, you can still trade him if you if you want to in the season but you just get him get him in the nhl for the rest of the season and you worry about the rest later and you buy yourself time to think i mean if you're a, a potential trade partner for the maple leafs as you said the leverage is certainly lower if there's no deal i mean at least if you've got that bridge deal in place and you know you've got a guy for was it now november so you know call it six months for argument's <laughs> sake at least you've got six months to try and say or persuade him that Signing in in this new city is the best thing for him, you know. Whether it be L.A. or Carolina, as we mentioned, and, and others, you know that that whole thing. I, and I know, I mean, you touched on it there. You know, the Matthews deal is upcoming in the summer as well. He's an RFA. Mitch Marner, uh, Kasperi Kapanen. So, you know, the, the, the Nylander thing is a kind of a domino effect. But equally, you know, at some point, does it go the other way and actually? rebound badly on the Leafs rather than trying to play hardball and not give Nyland uh, 7 or 8 million and then risk Matthews going, well, if he's worth that, I want 11 or 12 or whatever. At, at what point does the tipping point start to maybe go the other way on Kyle Dubas? Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's a very fair question, but I think when it comes to Nylander's contract, I, I think you have to. I mean, and I would hope that that uh, let, let's say a Matthews camp would understand. So let's say you sign Nylander for the rest of the year at an exorbitant amount of money, uh, and the Matthews camp wants to say, "Well, you're paying him that, then you have to pay us more." <laughs> I would hope that they would understand the logic that no, yeah. we were just trying to get him signed. We were doing what we had to do on a short term basis, and I think you guys understand that we did we were we were stuck right so i don't know i don't know if we should have that much faith in negotiating teams because i think uh, as we've seen with nylander every camp they don't they care more about the principal and they want to negotiate on behalf of their client they don't care what the other guy's getting they care about what their own guy deserves um so i'm not sure how it's going to play out but it does seem like no matter what's happened that uh, kyle dubas may have made an error when he when he was so confident, when he said he was so confident they would get everyone signed, mm -hmm. I think what he what he underestimated was the fact that uh, not every player has to automatically toe the line and appeal to what's what's for the good of the team. And the best example I can give is to anyone who's in any job. If your boss comes and says to you, "Hey, we want you to take a pay cut for the good of the company," but we're not going to let you know whether anyone else is going to take a pay cut. We just want you <laughs> to take one right now. Yeah. On principle, are you going to take it? And if you don't take it, are you being selfish? No, you're looking out for yourself and your family and your life, right? So I think people underestimate that it's a matter of principle for the Nylander camp. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's a great point about this is their job. Uh, and I've kind of, I, I kind of find it uncomfortable that, and, and don't get me wrong, the Maple Leafs aren't doing anything wrong. They're acting perfectly acceptably within the CBA. But kind of from a moral standpoint, I always find it awkward that teams kind of have the power to take a, you know, a season of a young player's career because he kind of won't bend to meet them more than they're willing to, you know, build the bridge to meet the player. And the way that restricted free agency works, it, that always sits very uncomfortably with me. And I wonder if, going back a, a good number of years now, if you get to a situation that Mike Pecker had with, uh, with Buffalo, where it got to such a strained point that he basically said, I don't see myself in a Sabre shirt ever again. And sure enough. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, well, it's funny you mentioned that too, because that, that thought did cross my mind when, I, when I've been saying, hey, Nealander should come back for the balance of the season on a one-year deal. The question is, what if the relationship is poisoned? And is it awkward mm -hmm. if he comes back to the team? And he'll obviously face a crush of questions from the media here. So that could prove difficult for sure. I don't envy the position he's in. Yeah, and as you say, that one name that pops into my head straight away is Ryan O'Reilly in Colorado. Yes, exactly. It's it's the negotiations eventually just ran him out of town, and I think it's very common when uh, for that to happen. And I I think we're getting pretty close to the point 
of no return with Nylander and the Leafs. I mean, I guess in a literal sense we are because it's almost December 1st, but I think also just from an emotional standpoint, um, I wasn't really of the belief that the negotiations were contentious, but I'm starting to wonder now. Uh, you know, I was saying that a couple months ago, but when you're this deep into the, into the process, uh, I can't imagine that these talks are going too smoothly if you're still at this big of a stalemate. Yeah, it's... It's interesting to watch, as we said, December 1st is, is right around the corner now. It's so hard to figure if anybody's going to give grounds, what the outcome's going to be. I mean, I, I, I'd kind of side with you at this point. You'd say a bridge deal would make the most sense for everyone. But whether that well has been poisoned, as we said, is, is the tricky bit. But uh, unfortunately, Matt, we've, we've run out of time for, for this week's show. Uh, it's been great to have you on once again. I'm going to put you on the spot with one final question as we are now about a quarter way into the season. Who do you like for Stanley Cup this year? I'm sticking to my guns and I'm betting on my own ego. Uh, I picked the Winnipeg Jets to win the Stanley Cup at the start of the year. And we as a magazine, we had them on our cover four years ago. We said, on the cover, beat your 2019 Stanley Cup champion, Winnipeg Jets. That prophecy is still looking good, and I want—I I want my <laughs> ego to swell. So I'm sticking with that pick, no matter what. And in all seriousness, I still think the Jets have the most balanced roster uh, in the NHL. They—they they have star power at every position. So I, I do believe that they're going to be the last team standing. Yeah, I—I I can't argue with that. I like the Jets. I—it's them or the Preds for me in the West, and I think Tampa's still the team to be in the East. But uh, it's hard to argue with anybody who. who plumps for the Jets to win the cup this year so Matt thank you very much for your time today uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of the year hopefully we'll speak again later in the season that would be my pleasure Robert it's great to be back and I'm sure we'll talk again soon